started really a new section of the epistle as he moves on to the practical aspects of the application of the gospel. The, we've had the exposition of the gospel in those chapters leading up to this section. But as we saw in uh, verse 1 of Romans chapter 12 last week, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And on the basis of the understanding of that gospel, we look in these chapters to how the gospel shapes our conduct, shapes our lives, shapes the development of our character. And so this evening we're going to be looking at the 13th chapter, which has got really three uh, clear sections to consider. Firstly, the first half of the chapter, verses 1 to 7, are about the subjection of the believer to the higher powers, to the civil authorities under whom we live. Then from verse 8 to verse 10, we have a section about love being the fulfilment of God's law. And the final section, verse 11 to 14, is a a section looking towards the coming of the kingdom, looking to the dawn of that new day of the kingdom of God and the need to put on Christ in preparation for his coming. And so then we commence then with this first part of the chapter, verses 1 to 7, subjection to higher powers. Verse One says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And so there's the the question for the believer, how should they interact with the state, with the authorities of the land wherever the disciple happens to live? And we get a clear answer don't we, in the verses of this chapter and elsewhere in the scriptures. Those powers under whom we live are there under the power and the control of Almighty God. As we read in Philippians, our conversation or our politics is in heaven from whence we await the coming of the Lord Jesus. Our involvement in politics will be as part of the rulership of the kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. But for now, we are under the authority of these higher powers. They are ordained by God. Some of those powers are more tolerant than others to believers of the gospel. But in general, the rulership and order established in the Nations of the earth brings order and generally looks positively on obedience. The only time believers need to stand aside is where there is a conflict between obedience to the law of men and to the law of God. And that's really the message of the verses in this chapter. God is in control. The higher powers are there, but they are ordained of God. And just in, in passing, we can think this is another strong argument against there being a supernatural devil. God is in control. There isn't another power that is beyond the control of God. God's always been in control. Those nations, right back from The time of Genesis were divided throughout the earth by God's commandment. The division of the 70 nations was according to the pattern of the number of the children of Israel. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows our needs and he knows how to bring about his purpose. And so as we read in Daniel chapter 4, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know 
that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. And so whatever type of government we live under, we need to follow this instruction from God's word to be subject unto a higher powers. And it was known from the Old Testament that sometimes life would be difficult for the believer. You think about the the words in Daniel chapter 7 about the persecution of the saints. That prophecy had already been there hundreds of years before that that Roman power would develop into a system which would persecute the believers. But the saints weren't called upon to fight against those powers. Not until the time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Think of those words of instruction from the Lord Jesus. Just come across to to Matthew chapter 10 for a moment. Practical advice to the disciples for the period after he had ascended. Matthew chapter 10. And verse 22 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall have not gone over these cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And so they weren't to fight. They were to move on in the face of persecution. This question about subjection to the authority of a a foreign power, the Roman authorities as it was at the time, had already been raised and answered, hadn't it, by the Lord Jesus. In Luke and chapter 20, the question was put to him, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or no? And... So you read in in Luke chapter 20, we know the answer of the Lord Jesus was, render, he says in verse 25, render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. And so it was lawful to pay tribute to Caesar, as well as to keep the laws of God. And so Romans in this epistle is consistent with that message to be in subjection to those higher powers, not to owe anything, but to pay what is due. We remember, of course, that Jesus lived under the power of the Roman authorities. He allowed himself to be put to death at the hands of those Roman authorities. And he said to Pilate when he was on trial that Pilate had no power except that which was given him of God. We read in John chapter 19 and verse 11. Often, as in this country, most of the time, We are blessed with being able to live a peaceable life. But even where that's not the case, submission is expected. You see the the teaching here in Romans, but it's consistent throughout the the rest of the New Testament. Let's just come across to the words of Peter, 1 Peter and chapter 3, where in that epistle we have the same aspect of our lives commented upon 1 Peter 3 um, and at verse 12 read verse 12 of 1 Peter 3 for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil 
And who is the he that will harm you? If ye be followers of that which is good. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be ye troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is within you, with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And so it's exactly the same teaching, isn't it, as we see in our chapter this evening, in Romans chapter 13. Yes, the powers are put there by God, and often they will punish the wicked. As Peter points out here, even if they choose to make the righteous to suffer, then that is the right thing to do, to learn, to suffer persecution for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see the, the words of Peter, and it's consistent with the words of the Apostle Paul later in his life when he was imprisoned. We just look across at uh, what he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy and chapter 2. First Timothy 2, first two verses. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. And so we desire and we pray for a peaceable life for those who rule over us to enable us to continue to worship peaceably and we live under those high higher authorities again we didn't turn to all of these references but in, in titus we read put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing meekness to all men. And the, the final reference on the screen, 1 Peter 2, verse 13, says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or to governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And so we do these things. We live according to the principles which God has given to us. And just returning to the um, verses in, in Romans chapter 13. Whoso, verse 2 says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And so we see this consistent message from the, the, all of the apostles in their their teaching of how we should live in this present dispensation and goes on to say in verse 5 
Wherefore, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. And so we don't just do the right thing because we'll get into trouble with the authorities, but it's our religious commitment and our religious conviction that drives us to do that which is right. It's for not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Paying our dues is pleasing to our Heavenly Father. We need to act with integrity at all times. Obedience is not just from fear, but a love of doing God's will. And so if we take these things on board, we can think of those words of earlier, earlier chapter in Romans, chapter 8. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It goes on to say, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And so we pray for the ability to live in peace. But if it's God's will that we should suffer, then we know that God has our eternal well-being in mind. We make ourselves then subject to the higher authorities. And the only exception to that is where the laws of man clash with what God requires. You can think of those exceptions, can't we, from the Old Testament, when the three friends of Daniel were faced with the requirement to bow down before the image of gold, and they refused to do so. Daniel chapter 3 and verse um, 17, they said, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And so there are times when we have to stand firm. When the law of man conflicts with the law of God. And the same point is made, isn't it, in the New Testament as the apostles were faced with the need to stand up to the Jewish authorities in the early chapters of Acts. Acts chapter 4 and uh, verse 19. Let's just turn across to to those two verses in in Acts 4 and 5 where the apostles were told not to preach the word. Acts chapter 4 and verse 18 says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And again in chapter 5 of Acts and verse 28, we read, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And so there is that exception. But for most of our lives, the teaching is there to be subject unto those higher powers. So let's move on then to the the second of our sections of this chapter. From verse 8 to verse 10 of of Romans 13. Just remind ourselves. Of this section. Where we read. Owe no man anything. But to love one another. For he that loveth another. Hath fulfilled the law. For this. 
Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And so verse 8 commences, Owe no man anything but to love one another. We shouldn't owe people. We should always pay our dues. But even when we have paid everything that's required, and we don't owe anything, we still do owe love. Love is always required. Love is always due. Because love is the fulfilment of the law. In verse 9, we have those elements out of the Ten Commandments from the book of Exodus. Thou shalt not. Five of them. The five commandments that thou shalt not in relation to working with our fellow mankind. These become a positive. Not that thou shalt not, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And this concept is also uh, out of the law, isn't it? Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 is where that phrase comes from. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And so that concept was there right back from the time when the law was given. And that one phrase comprehended the, the law, those elements relating to how we should live one with another. And it's a concept, of course, which is there in the discussions which Jesus had with those who came to him. Let's come across to Mark and chapter 12, where the question about the commandments of the law was put before him. Mark chapter 12. So verse 28 of Mark chapter 12 we read, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, And with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbour as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. And so Jesus was absolutely clear in answering that question about which is the first commandment of all. That first commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul and mind. And then, secondly, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So in Romans chapter 13, we're focusing, aren't we, on the second element of that. 
Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But we need to see this in the context of what we've already looked at in this practical section of Romans. The most important commandment is to love God. And that's exactly what we saw, isn't it, in Romans and chapter 12. Romans gives the greatest preeminence to the serving of God and then to the loving of neighbour as oneself. What did we look at in, in Romans chapter 12 last week? That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And what did the conversation say here in Mark chapter 12? To love the neighbour and to love God is more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Sacrifices under the law. Pointed forward to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that living sacrifice. The one who was there in Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not require, but a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus was that living sacrifice whose response to the call of God was, I delight to do thy will, O my God. And so here in this section in Romans, in Romans chapter 12, it starts with the requirement to be that living sacrifice, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. That is our reasonable service. And then here in Romans chapter 13, we move on to love our neighbour as ourself. And so this is a key principle, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And one which we need to focus on today, because the focus of the world is all upon each other, all upon man. There is no space for God. But the prominent thing, the first commandment, is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind and strength. And then that is developed into the love of our neighbours. And in this section which we're looking at in verse 8 to verse 10 of Romans 13, we have this word love. Owe no man anything but to love one another. And the, the word in this section is the uh, Greek word, the verb agapeo, or the, the noun agape, a special word chosen to speak of the care and the sacrificial love not necessarily about affection, but of the care of God for us and the care and the response which we have to him and as that's manifested to our fellow neighbours. And so in those Old Testament quotes we have in verse 9, that, that thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, quotation from Leviticus 19, it uses that word, that's the, this Greek word, agape. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And this is a, a concept then which is developed as we look at this, the use of this word um, for love throughout the New Testament as well. Just um, look at a few references which develop this idea for us. We come first of all to, to John chapter 13. So we here in John 13 are with the Lord Jesus in the upper room. In 
In verse 33 we read, Little children, yet a little while I am with you, and ye shall seek me. And as I said to the Jews, Whither ye go, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And so as we've seen back in Leviticus, that commandment was there from the beginning. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But here the Lord Jesus was about to lay down his life for his friends. And so he says... Love one another as I have loved you. Here was the perfection, the ultimate example of the demonstration of this agape love. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And so we have the, the love of the Lord Jesus for us. We just move on to the, um, the reference in Romans, earlier on in Romans chapter 5. And at verse 8, we have the love of God towards us. Romans 5 verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died while we were yet sinners. We were not his friends. We were not close. And yet God gave his son that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the love which God has shown toward us to Bring us to that wonderful hope. Again, if we uh, just move on uh, to some other examples in, in James, a couple of references in, in James chapter 2. Speak about the love of God and the love of thy neighbour. James chapter 2, verse Five. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? So we have the love, the agape love towards God. And verse um, 7 goes on. Do not they blaspheme the worthy name by which ye are called? Verse 8. If ye fulfil the royal or the exalted law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Ye shall do well. So here James brings those two ideas together. The idea of loving God and what we have echoed in Romans 13, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Doing these things, ye shall do well. And then finally, we just move on to this lovely section in, in 1 of John and chapter 4. First John chapter 4, starting at verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him 
that he who loveth God love his brother also. And so here in the the epistle of John, it really brings these ideas together, doesn't it? That we're called upon to love the Lord God. We're called upon to love our neighbour and ourself. As John shows here, if we don't love our brother, how can we claim to love God? That loving of our neighbour is a manifestation of the fact that we love our God. And so we see the beautiful concept here in the words of Romans chapter 13 that we develop from what we saw in chapter 12. We are living sacrifices, demonstrating our love for God. And here in chapter 13, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore Love is the fulfilling of the law. All the law is fulfilled in those two commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So let's move on then to the final section, to verse 11 through to verse 14. Looking to the coming day, verse 11, that knowing the time, That now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof. And so we live in a dark world, but we are looking for the day. As verse 11 says, knowing that Now is the high time to wake out of sleep. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. We belong to that coming day. We belong to the kingdom. We are citizens of the kingdom. And we need to live in recognition of that. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Whenever we came to the truth, we've made progress. We are nearer to the kingdom. And we need to have that anticipation. That needs to motivate how we live. And so we are brought out of darkness into the light. Just look at um, a couple of the references which which draw on these ideas and and complement the ideas in these verses. We come across to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 of Ephesians 5. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So we've made that transition, and it needs to shape our attitude to the world and to how we interact with it. If we just just turn forward again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Again, may I have words which help us to expand on these concepts. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 
and verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're to hold fast to the things of the light and turn our backs on the works of darkness. Some the phrasing in, in the authorised version in um, that, that verse um, perhaps a bit, a bit difficult. Weymouth translates verse 13 and he says, not indulging in revelry and drunkenness, nor in lust and debauchery, not in quarrelling and jealousy. We turn our backs on those things and we turn to the Lord God. We put on the armour of light. We've got the New Testament references on on the screen there that, uh, again, build on this idea. But just another um, reference which I'll just turn to for you is, is Psalm 104 and at verse 2, where we read about the creator himself, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. We are called upon to put on the armour of light, just as God is described as covering himself with light as with a garment. We are to be the manifestations of our Heavenly Father. We put on the light and we put on Christ. It says in verse 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. As well as to put on the armour of light. As we know, we put on Christ in baptism. They that are baptised into Christ have put on Christ. But that is only the beginning. Here we see the need to continue to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to put on Christ daily by trying to live like him. As Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, take up the cross daily and follow me. And so Ephesians and, and Colossians, again, pick up these concepts. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 21 says, If so be that ye have heard of him and have been taught of him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. A complete change, putting off the old and putting on the new. And as Colossians puts it in, in chapter 3 and verse 9 and 10, Lie not one to another, seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. So the chapter concludes with an exhortation. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof.
not to make provision for the flesh. The old man must die. As Brother John Carter puts it in his book on Romans, the old man is to die of neglect. Ephesians uh, chapter 5 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice of a sweet-smelling savour. Of course, for the flesh, it's easy to persuade ourselves that we need some free time, we need some idle time, we need some rest. But what do we do with it? I think of the words of, of Jesus in, in Luke chapter 11. He says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I'll return to my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and take it to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And so we need to put to death the old man, but we need to put something in its place. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ and strive to be more like him day by day. And so just one Final reference, Galatians and chapter 5. In our verse in, in Romans 13, in verse, verse 14, we've read, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And the exhortation in Galatians um, chapter 5 and verse 16 is, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we put on the Lord Jesus Christ... Filling ourselves with the mind of the Spirit which He manifested so perfectly. We will be like Him. We will walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so, brothers and sisters, let us take to ourselves the exhortations which come from this chapter. Let us build on that love of our Heavenly Father by manifesting our love for our brethren and sisters and those about us, seeking that there may be more to join with us in waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. We know that the night is far spent and the day is at hand, and so let us prepare for the coming of our Lord.